JavaScript. So rules to get by. Uh, like I said, we're not going to really talk about JavaScript much in this talk, uh, but it is relevant to pretty much everyone because you probably use some kind of version control. Hopefully it's Git. Uh, I'll, I'll hopefully try and prove to you that it should be Git if it's not. Um, but yeah, so uh, my name is Nick Nisi. Uh, I'm an organizer of this group uh, and the uh, once great NEJS comp. There are a couple of other organizers in here. We just had that, our last event uh, last month. And look for the videos out uh, coming to YouTube pretty soon. But that was a really fun event. Uh, I'm also the MC for TypeScript comp, which happens next month in Seattle. So if you're interested in TypeScript and Seattle, you can come together for that. Uh, <laughs> I contribute a lot to open source, particularly projects like Dojo. That's the one I get paid to do uh, quite a lot. And it's a framework similar to React or Vue. Um, but yeah, written completely in TypeScript. So I kind of, a, if you can't tell, I like TypeScript a lot. Um, and then I'm on a couple of podcasts, the JS Party podcast and TalkScript, which digs into uh, TypeScript more than anything. So yeah. But um, the way that I describe myself in my works like is like this, specifically there. I consider myself a Git custodian because a lot of times on the projects that I lead, uh, a lot of my time is spent curating Git, uh, not because I just have an obsession with it, but to deliver the correct things and the correct history to our customers and also to help them understand why Git is important because we think it is. We think that having a manageable history that you can use to go back and find things or to understand how things uh, happened is important. And so I spend a lot of time doing that. But uh, I asked this in the Midwest Dev Chat a couple of months ago now, uh, what is Git? Or I can't actually remember what I specifically asked, but I got these funny responses. And it's uh, Git gets easier once you get the basic idea that branches are homeomorphic endofunctors mapping sub-manifolds of a Hilbert space. And Linux is like uh, if the creator of Git wrote an operating system, which is true. Uh, <laughs> Linus, or Linus, or however you say his name, created Git and Linux. And so, uh, yeah, what, what this is saying is Git is easy, right? Uh, it's a distributed version control system where everyone who clones the repository has the entire history of the project, which is crazy to think that it used to not be that way. I kind of came in to the world of writing software using Subversion, and I never fully understood <laughs> Subversion. And uh, it blew my mind that you didn't have the full repository locally and couldn't just manipulate things the way that you can with Git with Subversion. And so I, I couldn't believe that that was the way that we used to, to work. Uh, and my personal opinion is it's better than Subversion, so yeah. Um, but those, those uh, responses or those tweets specifically, like, they imply that Git is difficult. Uh, and it is, but it's also kind of pretty great. The CLI is kind of difficult because there's a lot of weirdness to it, and hopefully we're going to go through a bit of that today. Uh, and then there's a lot of ways to do different things. It's, there's more than one way to do things, so there's not a prescribed path, and so everybody just kind of does Git the way that they want to do Git. Um, and that's, that makes it pretty great, but it also makes it more difficult. But the really great things about Git are that it's distributed. Like I said, everybody has a version of the repository locally. So if I have my project and I jump on a plane, I can do anything to that repository and then sync up later, and it'll all be fine. It also offers fast branching and merging. Um, and so a, a branch is really cheap in Git, not so much I, as I understand from other version control systems. Uh, so it's just really easy to create branches, destroy branches, merge branches, do all of that. And then Git has a really big social part to it, obviously, with GitHub. And I think that it's these three things that made Git popular, uh, as opposed to other things. It's more specifically the social aspect of it, because it kind of solidified and, and created a way to do open source and to do software that is repeatable and maintainable across all projects. So you have these, this idea of pull requests or merge requests or whatever you call them in your, your social Git of, of choice. But it, it gives you a way to do all of that in a really easy and repeatable way so that if I want to go contribute to your project, I don't have to go read through your mailing list and figure out what I need to do. I just go submit a pull request or a merge request or whatever. And it's as simple as that. <clears throat> so uh, at my job, my day job, I'm a uh, 
JavaScript contractor, basically. I go in and help pro uh, projects and customers with their JavaScript needs, primarily in TypeScript. Um, but I, I go in and work with that. So I end up working with a lot of different teams uh, on a lot of different projects. Sometimes I go into a completely green project and I get to set up the world and it's wonderful. Most of the time I go and join a team <clears throat> where they have years of history and I'm just going to be contributing a small piece to it and then moving on or uh, helping them to figure things out and then moving on. But I get to jump in at a lot of different, with a lot of different customers that are at different levels of Git understanding uh, and have different ways of doing things. And so this talk is kind of a me trying to condense down some rules that I came up with for when I'm working with clients and trying to preach to them the benefits of Git. And so I broke it down into these three rules that I'll try and kind of follow. And it's uh, one that it's actually hard to lose history. So don't be afraid to do things with Git. Um, commit messages eventually matter. So do like just get things into version control and then we can clean it up later. And then this one is kind of vague, but the feature of your feature is my future. And I think that I'll explain that a little bit more, but this one is the biggest pain point that when I come into projects and they're not doing Git properly, it's the biggest pain for me. Uh, so I've developed some methods to work around it and make not and working off of make working with feature branches off of feature branches off of feature branches sane. Uh, I heard a groan. Does that mean that, that happens? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it happens a lot. <laughs> Uh, so the first rule, uh, and specifically what we'll dig into, is the anatomy of a Git repository. So remember, the, the first rule is that it's actually hard to lose history. Let's look at what Git's actually doing to prove that. So go to my handy keynote terminal here and create a new Git repository. Uh, so I'm just going into a, a new directory and then running git init. And so it, I get this message back that Git has initialized a new empty Git repository at .git inside of that directory. And if I use my handy tree command to go look inside of .git, this is what I have in there. So this is my Git repository completely. Most of the time you don't ever have to think about this, but we're just gonna dig into it to understand uh, small pieces of it just to, to show that it's actually hard to lose history and to give us more confidence when we're actually doing changes. So uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at uh, reps and objects in here, and then also head. Uh, but the, this object database, this is where Git actually stores everything about your project that it knows. So in here, it'll have a bunch of different directories that it starts creating, and we'll kind of dig into that. But off the, uh, off the bat, it's pretty simple. So if we, had a, if we create a new file inside of this directory, not inside of the .git directory, inside of the project directory, uh, and this I'm just putting in hello world into a hello.txt file, and I just read that out with cat, and run git status, this is the message I get. So no commits yet, I'm on branch master, and Git knows that there's a file in my working directory that it's not tracking, so it lets me know that. Another way that we can do this is with the git status dash dash short, just to make it a little simpler, a little bit simpler, uh, I'll just run this command for everything else, but the double question mark just means Git has no idea about this file, it's not tracking it, it's not doing anything. Um, so it doesn't actually exist to Git size. Uh, so if I run a get log, uh, it fails, and it tells me that my master branch does not have any commits on it. So what do we do? We add it. Let's add the file using the get add command. And now let's look at the log, and it still fails because we didn't actually add anything. Uh, that would be crazy. Uh, so yeah, what that is doing uh, is it's actually doing something, and Git understands that it's doing something. So if we went back and looked inside of our .get directory, uh, and inside of the objects directory, we now have a new file in there, a new directory and a new file. And this is an object that Git is now storing. So Git now understands that there's a file out there, but it's not doing a whole lot with it quite yet. It's still not part of the history. There's just this new object in there. And what this object is called is, uh, it's a blob. And so this blob object contains the, the entire contents of hello.txt. Not the file name itself or anything like that, just the contents. So in our case, the contents is hello world. And how do I know that this is a blob? Git has a, a plumbing tool called cat file where I can say, give me the type of that file uh, and it will tell me that it's a blob. And what this is uh, doing is 4B5F, this is a unique identifier to that object. 
And so the, the SHA that, create, that Git creates for that is based off of the contents of the file. And it'll create a directory using the first two characters of the SHA that it creates. And then the file name will be the remaining 38 characters. Uh, so it's nice and easily readable and pronounceable. Um, and this is the, the internal blob structure that it's using. <clears throat> so if I ran uh, cat and I just looked at the contents of that file, it gives me garbage back. I don't understand any of that. But uh, like I said, I can run cat file dash t for give me the type, and it will give me back that it's a blob. And if I run dash p for print, it will give me back the contents of that file. So it will um, uh, it'll uh, un unencrypt is the wrong word, but it'll do that and give me back the contents, which is just hello world in this case. I have a question. Yeah. Can you, um, so four b five f. Yeah. Uh, I don't see a file called 4b5f. I see a file called 5fa6. Yep. But it's inside of a directory called 4b. So uh, yeah. Git doesn't, like when you're running these commands uh, through Git itself, it's not looking for, uh, it's not asking you to give it like file name information about this. Mm -hmm. It's asking you to give it unique identifiers. Uh -huh. And so the unique identifier that it uses is that SHA. So it's a 40 character long string. And it will be 4B, 5F. But the way that Git uh, stores that internally is it will take the first two letters and make that the directory name. So that when you go, like if you had to go search for this yourself, the, um, the, you won't just get an object, or an object directory that has thousands of files in it. You'll get an object directory that has maybe hundreds of directories in it that have subfiles in there. So every, command, every commit or object that starts with 4B will be in this directory. And then the remaining 38 characters will be after that. And so if there was another commit that I did, or a blob that I created, uh, that, or object that I created that started with 4B, it would just go into that directory. And it's just a way that Git tries to avoid having a single directory that contains hundreds of, or thousands of objects. OK, thanks. Yeah, good question. So the blob structure itself, how did it create that hash, that 40 character long string? Well, it took the type of object that it is. In this case, it's a blob. and uh, a length. So the length is the content length of the actual file that we had. So remember that file just contains hello world in it. That's 12 characters total here plus a null character at the end saying that that's the end of the file. And it puts that uh, after a null character here. And so if we were to run git hash object with that exact content, every single time we'll get the same hash back. We'll get 4b5f. And if we did the same thing and passed it to OpenSSL SHA-1, we get the exact same thing. Every single time for a file that has that content, we'll always get the same blob back, or the same uh, SHA back. And so that's how Git is storing this internally. And it's all based on the contents of that file, uh, what that SHA ends up being. And so if you created another file that had the exact same contents, Git will only store the one, and it'll just reference it later. And we'll get to how it references it in the next few slides. But that way, it only has to keep track of the contents uh, for this each time. Now, if I were to go and create another, like let's say we skip all of this and we go commit, and then we create another uh, another commit and we add additional content to it, maybe we add uh, hola mundo, so hello world in Spanish, to the file. Git will store another blob that contains the entire contents of that. It'll store hello world in one, and then hola mundo as another completely different object that we'll have to go find. But all of this was created when we ran git add and added that hello.txt file. Uh, so when we ran git add, it didn't actually commit anything, but it, what it did was it added it to the staging uh, section of git. And so this is a step before the commit process. And in my git early days, this was just an annoyance I had to deal with. And then git aa basically, or git add-a, and then uh, go straight to commit after that. What I do now is I use the staging uh, section to be able to piecemeal commits out of that. And so you can do git add-p, and that will allow you to stage different hunks of a file or chunks of a file. And then you can say that I want to create a commit where I added console.log here. And I want to create a, another commit where I uh, added you know, a new function down here. And maybe you don't want them separate, or you, you don't want them together, so you have them as different commits. The staging area is what allows you to do that. So I can work all day long changing files all day and then just piecemeal stage things together using the staging area and create commits off of that. And then I have everything 
as small as it can be. And what I try and do is keep commits as small as possible because when I go back and need to use tools to find out where like a, a regression came in, if the commit is small, it's easy to say that's the commit that did it and it's easy to see exactly what the problem is. But if it's uh, you know, 10,000 lines that have changed, well, yeah, that's the commit, it doesn't really help me. Now I have to spend the entire day looking through the, the diff for that. So yeah, uh, it's just a place that allows the commits to be built up uh, and focus rather than just a, an, an accumulation of all of the current changes. So what are the importance of blobs? Well, the blob object is tied to rule number one that I had, which is it's actually hard to lose history. As soon as I ran git add, git now knows about that and there's a blob in there. So even though it would be ridiculous to try and go find the contents of that file, if I went and deleted hello.txt, technically I still have the contents of it inside of git as a blob. And it will not disappear anytime soon. It will only disappear later on when garbage collection gets run, or if you manually run garbage collection. Um, but it's there. So if I really needed to go find it, it's there. So it'll store a complete copy of that file. Um, and then that, that file or that blob will contain the complete contents. And one thing to note uh, that I don't really get into much in this is that when garbage collection does actually run, all blobs that, that stick around do actually get condensed down into a pack file. And then those pack files are used. So instead of uh, having blob objects that contain the entire contents of the file over and over and over, it just contains the file and then diffs to that file going forward. So you can still get out all of it with the git commands, um, but it's just not as, as simple. <clears throat> so if I went and made further commits, we've added, we've run git add for hello.txt. And now if I did exactly that, I added the Spanish equivalent to hello.txt and I run it, um, Git says that now I have, I've added a new file and that's in the staging area, but I've also made further modifications to it. Um, and then if I just run Git checkout, uh, or I think Git restore now maybe, um, then it will undo that and the contents of the file will just have hello world in it and it will go back to just understanding that there was just the contents there. So because I didn't run git add again, it didn't create or update the blob at all. Uh, that that change is now gone. But so we, we've added this. Now let's just go and commit it. So if we run git commit and give it a commit message, then it will commit that. And if we go look in the uh, git objects directory, we have two new hashes in there, 639d and 82ad. And what are these two new objects? Well, they're tree objects and commit objects. So the tree, and, and we can find all of that out by just running uh, cat file dash t for each of them to find that out. And let's talk about what trees are. So a tree is just an, uh, data that stores information about file names and permissions that are associated to different blobs. And so a tree will contain things like the permission of the file. So in this case, 644, that's read and write for me. Uh, read and read for groups and everyone on the machine. And then the type of file that it's, or a, of object that it's referencing, in this case, it's referencing a blob, uh, and this is that, that uh, SHA for this blob, so 4B5F. Trees can also reference other trees, and so a tree you can think of as a directory structure or a file name. So if you had a file, a directory named source, there would be a tree in there called, that, that maps to another tree called source, and then inside of there, if it had any files, it would that tree would map to the files inside of it. Uh, but then it would also map to file names, so in this case, hello.txt. So it's saying that the contents of the file here will have a file name of hello.txt in the root directory, and it's a blob, and its file permissions will be 644. So when you go create this, when I go clone this, create a file that matches this, and put the contents of this blob in there. <clears throat> and so it stores all of that. And if we, were, if we ran get cat file dash p on 82AD, that's exactly what it gives us out is 644 blob and then the blob object SHA and the file name. Now the commit structure is pretty similar. Uh, it's going to reference a tree. And so it'll have the tree in our case, 82AD will be the tree that it's referencing. It can also reference other trees if there's several other trees in there. And it will reference a parent commit. In our case, because this is the first commit that we've ever done, uh, it's empty. So git creates a linked list of commits. So every commit knows about its parent all the way up. And this is one of the few times where you actually need to know about 
computer science-y stuff to, and linked lists to uh, understand what it's doing. But it's not, it's just that each commit references its parent and so on. Uh, but then it has author information and committer information. So this would be the name of the person and the email address, and that's all coming from your git config, and then a timestamp and uh, for each of these. Now, more times than not, the author and committer are going to be the same exact fields. Um, and then it has a commit message. But if the, uh, where that can change is like if I authored the commit and then pushed up a pull request and you, and I was using tabs and you switched it to spaces and then just committed that but uh, still attributed it to me, you would be the committer on that and I would still be the author on that. And you'll sometimes see that in, in Git's, uh, GitHub's UI where it has kind of two avatars squished together. And that's because one of them is the author, one of them is the committer. But it has all of that information, and this is all of the information that it's using to create the uh, SHA for that. So the main thing that makes this unique between every commit uh, is you can change the commit message, and then the timestamp for the author and committer will probably be different, and that will not always, but almost certainly guarantee that the uh, SHA will be unique for every commit that you do. And then it's always pointing to a, a specific tree, so it has a lot of different variables to change up what the SHA is. So the, the commits point to a tree object, and the tree object will point to a blob that's contained within, and it will have the contents of the file. So hello.txt will have the contents, hello world, and that's all been committed uh, by me in a commit message, or a commit that has the message initial commit. <clears throat> Any questions on the internal blobs? Yeah. Is that why there's a limitation on uh, having I think so, yeah. Because it's, uh, the tree would point to, well the tree wouldn't point to any blob objects and so it wouldn't really have anything to store there. Uh, and so that's why a lot of times you'll see projects will put like a .git keep file in there or something and that's kind of been a de facto standard to, to keep directories around. Good question. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, <clears throat> so the other part inside of the, the um, git directory is git references. And these are just uh, references or just simply refs that point to a single commit. And so you can think of references as the internals for branches, tags, or remote branches if you're pulling from GitHub or somewhere else. And so if we went and looked in the .git slash refs directory, this is what it would look like by default if you didn't have any other branches or tags created. Uh, it would have a heads directory and inside of there, there would be a file called master. And if we went and looked at master, it would point to uh, a SHA. We just have a SHA. And so if you remember from a few slides back, 639D was the SHA for the commit, the initial commit that we had. So master is now pointing to 639D. And if we switched, uh, and I'm using the new, this is in the latest version of Git where they, they have experimental, um, experimental commands called switch instead of checkout and restore instead of checkout. Um, I'm switching to a new branch that I create called feature branch. And if I went and looked inside a feature branch, it's also still pointing to 639D because it's just a like a pointer to that commit. And then from there, it would have a pointer to all of the previous commits along that, that uh, history. Same thing with head. If I went and looked at get head, uh, dot get slash head, it will have a reference to the current branch that I'm on. So it will just have this in there that is pointing to feature branch. But if I switch back to the previous branch, then look at git head, it's just pointing back to master. And so this is how git knows what branch you're on, is whatever head is pointing to is where you're at. <clears throat> so in both cases, it just points to your commit and then head always points to the current branch that you're on. Now there's this new, or not new, but there's this new, uh, I keep saying new. <laughs> there's this thing called the mythical ref log uh, and this is just a log that keeps track of everywhere that head points to. And so then from there, you can take actions to get other places. And the cool thing about this is it will literally update for everything, every time the head changes. So if you switch branches, it changes. If you make a new commit, that is telling uh, Git that like master, for example, has a new commit on it at the top level. So that changes the contents of uh, what head is because, well, technically what master is, and so it's pointing to a new commit and it will have all of that in there. If we switch between branches, it's changing all of that. And so this is a weak reference to commits. 
And the way that Git works with garbage collection is every time you, you create these blobs, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Sorry, blobs, uh, trees, or commits. Anytime you create any of those, they don't just disappear. If I deleted uh, everything outside of the .git directory, those will still be there. And if I delete commits, they'll still be there. If I switch branches, all of those objects are still there until garbage collection runs. And what garbage collection will do is it will look for objects inside of the objects directory and see if anything is referencing them. And so that could be, is master referencing them? Do you have another branch that is referencing them along the, the, the history? So if, at some point, does some commit that master or any other branch references, does that reference this commit? Or and the, from that commit, does it reference this tree and or this branch, uh, blob? If it does, keep those around. If it finds things that it can't, um, that, that aren't being held onto by some kind of reference, then that's where the garbage collection comes in. It will go and free those up by deleting those objects. And the only exception to that is the ref log, where this has references to everything that you've done, but this is a weak reference, so it excludes this from saying, is there a hard reason to keep this around? If it's only the, the ref log, then I can just remove it. But otherwise, as long as garbage collection hasn't been run, uh, these, all, all of your commits, all of your trees, all of your blobs are still there, and you can always go back and reference them. And by always, I mean for probably about 30 days or so. Uh, so you have time to figure out if you really messed something up and go back. So it's, uh, it's not a bad thing. That, that's kind of the main point of, of um, rule number one, is that because of this, because there's always a way to find these blobs and these trees and these commits, it's hard to lose history if you know where to go. And now you know where to go. So it's inside of the get objects directory and head will always point to uh, whatever branch you're on, master by default. Any other branches will also point to different commits. These commits uh, will point to trees and the trees will point to blobs. So if you know the commits, you can find the trees and find the file name information and then you can find the contents of those files and pull those out. On the previous slide, all your yep. shards were the same on the left. Is that yep. just The commit should be different for you. So I think the 639D would be different for you. On the previous slide, all those are the same. That's not what my rep log looks like. I'm just curious if that's. Oh, that's because I only have a single commit and I'm switching between branches and everything. So my one commit, uh, there's no other reference that I can have in my simple setup. Oh, feature branch and master are the same. Commit. Yeah, because they're pointed uh, to the same commit. Gotcha. Okay, thank okay. you. Yep. <clears throat> So these commits always point to a parent, which makes that, um, that linked list that I talked about. Uh, and from there, you can always find out who the parent of a commit is until you get to the first commit, in our case, that has no parent, and then you know that that's the first commit or, in, or initial commit. And because of this, and because the branches, like if you go actually look at what branches are holding with those refs, it's just holding a commit, uh, a SHA in there. And so that's why branching is so cheap in Git, because you're just saying, this branch now points here. And then if I commit to that branch, that branch now points to a new commit that's at the top. And then from there, it can go back. And so at some point when you branch off, uh, like a feature branch, for example, will probably have some commit that is in common with the branch that it was branched off of. In our case, it's commit three uh, or C3. And so from there, that's how I know that it's basically C1, C2, C3, C4, and C6 are everything that's on feature branch. And then C1, C2, C3, C4, C6 are on master branch. This should be like C7. They shouldn't both be the same. Yep. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so they should have different commits. Uh, but then from there, Git uses this to figure out how to do things like merges and uh, rebasing, where it, it'll figure out where the common commit is between them and then use that to, to figure out where to go next and what to do. So in summary of rule number one, uh, as soon as a file is staged at all, the contents of that file are saved. And so if you deleted that file on accident, uh, if your cat sat on the computer or did anything and that file's gone, you can go back and find the blob and get it back if it was really, really important. Um, and then the commit trees, or commits point to trees which point to blobs. Uh, and so as long as none of them are orphaned along the way, they'll, they'll stick around forever. But once they're orphaned, then garbage collection will eventually pick them up. And then branches and tags will always point to a single commit. So if you need brand, uh, commits to stick around, you can just create a branch and then leave that branch sitting there 
uh, and it'll it'll stick around. And you can push those branches up to GitHub or wherever you're hosting. So rule rule number two: history is eventually important. Um, above all, Git's a communication tool. Uh, that's why it's so popular is because of the social aspect of it with GitHub and everything. But at the end of the day, when we're making these commits, we're doing it because we are contributing to a team of other developers, and we have to we have to be able to describe the changes that were made, and that's using diffs and things like that, along with the commit messages that we have. So what are we actually changing and why? And so Git is that communication tool. And this is a quote from me. It gets great and easy in this example until you have to work with others. Then it becomes more difficult. But uh, Git tells the chronological story of what happened in your repository. So you get this spaghetti of everything that happened uh, all along the way. And I think that that is not the way that it should be. And this is where the commit messages matter eventually. I think that Git should tell the chronological story of what should have happened in your, in your project. Because that makes things a lot easier and cleaner if you need to go back and, um, and fix things later. So um, when the biggest thing that happens with this is, um, <laughs> the biggest thing that happens with this is people develop different strategies of keeping things around. And that is everything from how do we commit, do we have special commit, um, like rules that we follow for the commit logs, to do we do branching uh, with rebasing, or do we merge? Uh, how do we do all of this? And so um, that's kind of the big thing that I'm going to talk about in this one is rebase or merge. Which one is better? And I think that both of them have their merits. There's pros and cons and to there's both really of them. Rebase, wrong way to do. Uh, the pros are that the history remains flat and readable. Uh, and then super, superfluous commits uh, are likely non-existent because you have uh, manicured your, your history to be exactly what you want it to be and nothing else. The cons to that is it can be dangerous because rebasing means that you are changing history. And when you change history, then you have to force push history up. And if you're doing that at all where you shouldn't be, which is any branch that someone else might be looking at, then that becomes really dangerous. I've done it. I've done it in like on a real production project for several months. It's not fun for anybody involved. Um, and another con is that, yeah, you always have to use the force flag when you push things up. But if you're on a branch that you know that only you're looking at, then force is fine. It's totally great. And actually, there's a, an easier force with lease command that should be the default, I think, uh, that will actually fail the force if history has changed out from under you. So if somebody else force pushed and then you try and force push, it's not going to delete theirs and put yours in there. Force with lease will fail your, your force push and let you know so that you can go have a discussion. Because Git is a social tool. Um, and then merge, the pros of this are traceability. The merge commits will always show the historical information of the entire branch history. So you can see where you branched off, all the commits that were added to that, and then you have a merge commit that goes and puts that back into the master or the develop branch or whatever, and from there. Um, the con of that is history becomes very polluted. There is There are ways to work around this uh, with tools. Also, I'm only talking about Git command line tools because in my opinion, and I understand that it's only my opinion, the command line is the one true way, um, but I won't get into that. Um, but things like first parent flag can be helpful with hiding superfluous information. Um, but the, another con is that if a feature branch has any irrelevant commits in there, they're part of the new history, and if you don't rebase correctly or, or merge correctly, you might have duplicates of commits in there that have the same history and same commit messages with different SHAs, and then things just get out of control. So my preference is this nice rebase-based history. This is an actual project, uh, the Dojo project that I work on. Everything is linear. Everything is easy to find. You can go through and you can see this is where the head is. Oh, that's where we tagged 6.0 alpha 14. Oh, there's where we tagged 6.0 alpha 13. And this is everything in between. So if I wanted to find out what changed between those two, nice and easy to follow. Uh, and it's just the same thing going all the way down. So nice and easy. This is another project I use a lot uh, called TypeScript, and I don't know what's going on there. Um, <laughs> I went back a little ways, but if you look through pretty much the whole history, it looks kind of like this, and that's okay. They make it work, obviously. They're like the most popular project on GitHub, so I'm not saying you have to be like this, but it is nicer, and it's easier to find things and find where things went wrong as opposed to this, where I have no idea what's going on. So. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, if we look at a rebase in action, you start with a commit, and we might add several commits to that. And then eventually we branch off from those commits and create our feature branch. So C3, C5 is our feature branch that's all based off of C1. So what get rebase will do is it's going to identify the new commits that have happened since branching. And this is where if we're running the get rebase and we say get rebase off of whatever the latest, in this case, master is, um, find out what the latest commits are. And then we're going to find out where the common commit is between them. So we know these are the new commits. This is the common commit that is shared between both histories. And so what we want to do, rebase will take the history from the common commit point, and it will basically lift up those commits and move them to the end. And so they're based off of the new latest history. And so that's why you get new uh, SHAs every time you do a rebase, is because the parent commit has changed, which will, even if everything else about the commit has stayed the same, the parent commit has changed, and so uh, it, Git will create a new SHA for that. But now, we have a nice linear history, and this is how the history stays linear for everything. But one tool can, be, um, can make uh, both strategies really useful, and that's the interactive rebase, which I use a ton, all the time, rewriting history, because I, want, I don't want my coworkers to see, and more importantly, my clients to see the mess of work in progress, work in progress. Uh, I think it's working, it's not working. All of these <laughs> terrible commit messages <laughs> that I have all the time, I want it to be just a couple of commits, like, oh, you know, fix thing, fix this, added this, like very, very sane commits that are very um, small in structure that I use to get staging to structure them correctly. And I do that by committing all of those work in progress, work in progress all the time. And then before I submit the pull request or maybe after I submit the pull request and it gets approved, I go and prune things out using the interactive rebase. And that's because, as Michael Crichton said, good books aren't written, they're rewritten. And he wrote Jurassic Park. So, yeah. <laughs> The first one was at least was at least good. Um, <laughs> so when you run git rebase dash i or dash dash interactive, and you give it a commit, uh, and this is a, a commit from the past that you want to rebase off of, it's going to go and pull all of the commits into your editor uh, for the latest head to that commit, and so it'll have everything in there, and then it has these uh, verbs next to it. So by default, it's always pick 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 pick. And so it's going to pick that. And if I just hit save and quit, then it's basically not going to change anything because nothing has changed it. I've picked all of the commits to be there. But there are all of these other commands that I can do. Reword. So that would reword the commit message, but keep the commit the same. Uh, keep the commit the same otherwise. Edit is one I use a lot that will let me go in and say, this was a good commit, but I had a bunch of console.logs in there that I shouldn't have had. So I can go edit that, delete those, and then save that as the same commit minus the commit messages, or the console.log messages, and now I've rewritten to have a perfect history with that. Um, if it's just a commit where I basically like did the same thing, but I just committed like remove console.log messages, I can use fix up or squash, and that will take the commit and just squash it or push it into the previous commit, the parent commit, or the one just above it, and then now it's part of that. And if you use squash, it concatenates the commit message from uh, that commit into that one. If you use fix up, it just drops the commit message for that one and makes it part of the, the other commit. And then there's other ones like um, X for execute. You can exe run a command if you wanted to do different things. You can tell it to stop here so that you can basically have full control of making different changes. You can drop a commit. You can also just delete that, a commit from this list, like if I deleted this one, add coc.invem. If I deleted that, it's like that commit never existed. So you can easily get rid of history, you can easily change history, and you can easily ruin your day right here. Um, but as we learned with rule number one, it's actually hard to lose history, so you can go back and find those, probably using the ref log in this case. But the point of all of this is that you should really only keep the commits that matter. And this works with either strategy that you're using. So if you were creating a feature branch and you know that that full history of the feature branch is gonna be merged, prune that down to remove all of the work in progress commits, or at least reword them to not have that in there so that it looks a little more professional. So with that, clean history matters um, because clean history tells the story of how the project should have happened. Um, and it's approachable to new developers on the project. If you are a new developer on TypeScript and you go look at that and you try and figure out what is going on, it's gonna be really difficult as opposed to uh, the other project I showed 
where everything is nice and linear and you can see what's happening and you can see everything that has happened and you can go look at those commits and they're nice and easy and understandable. So it's really easy. This allows you to also more easily utilize tools that Git provides you. Things like Bisect, which we'll look at next, um, which allows you to find regressions with ease. And above all, a clean history just keeps you sane. So uh, one tool that I wanted to call out specifically is Bisect. Uh, has anyone used Bisect here? Yeah? Nice. A good, good show of hands. Um, it's a really helpful tool that allows you to find where something is different. And that different could be right or wrong in the repository. So that could be bugs in a lot of cases. Oh, a bug was introduced. I need to go find out what commit introduced that because it, I know at some point it was working. Uh, or uh, the way that I end up using it a lot is with bug fixes where I'm in a ver like a branch for a specific version of the open source project I'm working on. And I know that it was fixed in this branch. Now I need to go apply it to the previous branches. So like for, I'm on you know version 1.13. I need to apply that to 1.12, 1.10, 1.9. I have different branches for each of those. I have to go find where that is. And so Git Bisect allows you to do that by effectively dropping you into the middle of a commit range that you give it. And then you tell it, you go and run some tests or you can automate the test and you tell it whether or not it was uh, the problem or the solution exists there with these good or bad flags. And that's really confusing, especially if you're trying to find a bug fix, then I'm saying, oh, it, it was fixed here, so that is bad, but no, it's not fixed here, so that's good. And like you, like it's really confusing. But Git allows you to change those, so we'll, we'll see that on the next slide. Um, and this is another computer science -y term, what it's doing is effectively a binary search. It's going to drop you in the middle, and then you say good or bad, and if you say good, it goes up here, and if you say bad, it goes down here and picks the next, drops you in the, the middle of those other half of commits. And so you don't have to look at every single commit. It's just going to keep dropping you in the middle of the commit range that it's condensing down, so you only have to look at, I've, I think the most I've ever had to look at is like 10 commits, which is not, not terrible. So let's run a quick experiment, a random egg. <clears throat> Let's say that we had a script like this that's going to create a file called egg.txt, and uh, it's going to do 20 commits. So for one in 20, we're going to echo uh, if the uh, commit that we're in is equal to the random number that I picked out of 20, uh, then we're going to commit, here's the egg in there. Otherwise, we're just going to uh, echo in no egg in there and so basically, one of the 20 commits at some point will add, here's the egg in there. And so we're going to use git bisect to find out which commit out of this random script added, here's the egg. So if we uh, did git log dash dash one line dash dash graph, uh, we have 20 commits. We have our initial commit, and then we have 20 random commits that, we, that were just put in there by the script. And so our commit messages aren't being very helpful here. We're not able to find out which one added the egg from this. So what we can do is we can say get bisect start, and here is where I'm doing dash dash term old. So instead of saying good or bad, I'm going to say that when it's old, instead of saying bad, I'm going to say there's no egg in there. And when it's good uh, or new, I'm going to say egg. <clears throat> to make it either more confusing or less confusing, depending on how you're looking at this. So then you say get bisect start, and uh, I'm going to say get bisect no egg. So I know the egg does not exist at 719, but I know the egg exists at the latest commit, commit 20 head. You have a question? Does old mean that the search is going to go forward in the history or backwards? It means. Uh, like if you're doing a binary search. I think it means it's going to go backwards. Okay. Oh, I think old means backwards and new means forwards. Okay. I think. I'll probably be wrong on that, but I think so. Um, yeah, so this is where I'm telling it my parameters. I'm saying that at some point, so I'm saying 719, which here, 719 is the initial commit. There's no egg in there at 719. And there is an egg at commit 20, so 76A. And so then I start, and it's telling me that there are roughly nine revisions that I have to go through. So that means roughly three steps. So I have at most three steps until I find exactly which commit added that. So it put me right in the middle of that at random commit 10. So now that's basically what I have checked out on the project. And so if I do a cat and I see, here's the egg. Well, good, now I can say the egg is in there. So I say get bisect egg. 
And so it'll give me uh, four revisions left, so two steps left. So now I'm at random commit five. Uh, and in here, here's the egg. The egg is still in there. So I say git bisect egg. It drops me into random commit two. Still there. Git bisect egg. Uh, and I run that. Now I run git bisect no egg. So now the egg does not exist. Or I'm sorry, no egg when I cap that out. So it doesn't exist at random commit one. And so then when I run git bisect no egg here, then it tells me you're done. The first commit that added that was random commit two. So I was easily able to, with just enough steps that can fit on one slide, uh, find out exactly which commit added this. And so this could be, uh, like in a real world example, this could be drop me at this commit, let me run npm test. And let me test, run the test and see, are the tests failing here? No. Are the tests failing here? Yes. And if it's something as simple as that, like I run this commit and it fails or it doesn't fail, if, this, if it's as simple as that, then you can automate bisect and tell it exactly what command to run. And if that command returns non-zero, then it fails. If it returns zero, then it succeeds. And it will just run the entire bisect for you and spit out the commit that has that right at the end. So nice and easy, easy way to do this. Like I said, the most common use for me is finding bug fixes. Uh, and then after that bug, where bugs were introduced. Because I hardly ever introduce bugs, let's be honest. No, that's not true at all. Um, so yeah, that is, is um, bisect. Any questions on that? Cool. So I have one more rule. And that is the feature of my feature is my uh, feature. And this was a tough rule to name, but this is something that comes, that, that happens to me a lot in projects that I'm just jumping into, uh, or I'll give you a specific use case. I was on a project where we were developing a uh, design library for a client. And I was on this project for 15 months. And 10 of those 15 months, I was developing one web component. Just a single one, and it was a grid, so it was massive, right? And this grid had editable cells in it, which used other web components that they were creating along the side uh, at the same time as us. So it would have text fields or number fields or drop downs or selects or combo boxes and all of these different things. And as they were developing them, we were also developing. And so they had they were using get, the Git flow strategy, and they had a develop branch. And so we branched off of develop and created our branch. And that branch stuck around for 10 months. It was a long running feature branch, not super fun. But from there, we kind of had our baseline of work. And then we would branch off of that and say, OK, now I'm going to add the ability to edit cells. And that would be a new branch. And so that would be a feature branch off of my feature branch. And then eventually, I would bring that back. But at some point, I'm going to need the other components that were being developed by another team that was part of this big company. And so I would have to rebase those commits in. Because if I just did a merge, then my history gets all messed up and I can't figure out left from right. And it's it's tough to like give them a, a change log based on what we're actually delivering you know, every month. And so I would go in every morning and do a rebase, pulling their latest stuff in, and then rebase all of the independent branches off of that. And at first, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And so it was just a lot of pain. Um, but I quickly learned a way to do this more easily without losing any history um, and without having to just suffer every single day. Uh, so yeah. <clears throat> so a long running branch, this is kind of the, the scenario I just explained where you have maybe master and then you have a bunch of commits going off of develop and then here's our long running branch. So they've committed three commits after that. I've got my long running branches and then I've got features that are based off of that. And so we're just trying to keep everything in a nice flat uh, structure without going insane. So when I git checkout long running branch, and if I were to run uh, git rebase develop, and if I did that, what that would do, remember rebase will take the, uh, it'll go find the common commit and say, okay, all of these commits after that are part of what's new on long running branch. And here's the latest commit on long running branch or on develop because that's what I'm rebasing off of. I need to reapply those commits here. And so it will effectively be the same commits, but I added the, the comma in there to indicate that they are new shots. So C3 is the same commit as uh, C3 comma is, or uh, apostrophe is the same thing as C3, but it's uh, a different shot because of that. But now long running branches over here. Now these feature branches that I was working on 
are problematic because now if when if I tried to get rebase uh, develop or rebase long running branch again, it's going to go try and find the common commit between what is now long running branch and feature branch. And now technically, C2 is the common commit between them. So it would reapply C3, C4, C5, C9, C13, and C14 over here. So now I would immediately have duplicate commits of C3, C4, C5, and C9 on there. And it would just be problematic because Git's just looking at the commit um, SHAs and seeing that they're different. So if we wanted to do this, what we would want to do, this is what would happen, is it would do, do that, and now we have all of this, and it's, we have these double commits in there. <clears throat> so kind of terrifying. This is what I was doing for a while, and it was not fun. I eventually went back and cleaned it up, but super not fun at all. So the issues with that is that Git just doesn't know that C9 and C9, uh, C9 tick are essentially the same commit because it was rebased and now it has a new SHA. Uh, so to complete this rebase properly, we have to reapply the commits, but we have to be able to tell Git specifically what to rebase because Git's not smart enough to do it on its own. Luckily, we are. So Git has a really handy tool uh, called git rebase dash dash onto, which took me forever to figure out uh, that it exists. But once I did, it was just amazing. And so with this, it gives you more control, more granular control. And you can say git rebase dash dash onto. So this, in this case, it would be develop. I want to rebase it onto, or feature branch, long running branch. Uh, git rebase dash dash onto long running branch from the starting commit. So I would tell it where the actual changes are. And then it would either go to head or I could specify the ending commit from there. So if we wanted to do that, we check out long running branch. And then we say git rebase develop. What that's going to do is it's going to, uh, sorry, if we do run uh, git rebase dash dash onto long running branch C9, what we've said is uh, we're on feature one. We want to say, we want to rebase onto the new long running branch from C9 because that was the last commit that was actually where, where we branched off of here from. So C10 and C11 are the only new commits that were on feature one. Uh, but we want it to be a part of the new long running branch. So we tell it specifically to run from commit nine uh, and rebase onto long running branch. And then we only have those two commits on there. So now we have a nice clean linear history for feature one branch. Does that make sense? <clears throat> now this can get really confusing as you're going along because if you're going along and you're constantly doing this every morning like I was basically, uh, to keep my branches in line. And I basically taught the other developers to do the same to keep their branches up to date with everything. Uh, but I would go and do it for our long running feature branch every morning. And then that way they just knew how to do this. The problem was sometimes it got really confusing about where the actual last commit was. More specifically, what the first commit was for the feature branch that you're on. So if you remember, oh, the feature I'm on is always, you know, this something with this commit message then it's nice and easy. But that wasn't always the easy case. A lot of times it was just, which is the last commit that I had, and then go one beyond that. But if I was the last one to also commit to the long running branch, then that's where it gets more confusing. So a tip uh, that I have is to use an empty commit as a separator. And the reason I say an empty commit instead of like a tag or something for that is because the empty commit will follow the branch around as you're rebasing it every day. Um, and so with that, you have some kind of separator comment in there that makes it nice and easy and stick out in your history. And then you just interactive rebase that out of there when you're actually done and ready to merge it uh, or rebase it into master and everything is good. So the way that you would do that is git commit dash dash allow empty uh, and then give it like a message like separator for feature one or something. And now when you look at your, your branches, I can see here's the first commit of this new feature branch every time. And it's just an empty commit. So I can go delete this commit later on and it won't affect anything about my actual branch. But that's, the, that's where it is. So every day, I just pick the one before that, in this case, DC3, and I rebase dash dash onto from there and keep going. Any questions? Yeah? Um, why rebase onto C9 instead of C9 tick? Uh, because, so I, I eventually want it to be off of C9 tick, but these two commits are effectively the same. However, when uh, Git is going through the history to find the common commit, if I just ran Git rebase, um, Git's going to automatically try and find the common commit. And it's going to go all the way back down to C2 as the common commit between them. What uh, dash dash onto 
it's allowing me to say, I want to rebase onto this branch, and then it allows me to specify the common commit myself. And so I know that C9 was actually the common commit here. So then it will take all of the commits after that and rebase them onto here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mentioned uh, that the rebase can be the ranges. Yeah. Sometimes you think like it's inclusive, this and this. You actually have to add a carrot behind it, otherwise you end up getting a right. after. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Uh, very good point. So like in, in the case of this, where I have the separator, you could do the separator uh, caret, and that would be, that's just telling git, take this commit, and then the caret means the one before that. Uh, in my case, I always just looked at this and uh, manually like selected the one before that. But if I wanted to write a script, which would be the smart thing to do, uh, it would be to use the caret from that. So uh, good call. <clears throat> All so those are the rules uh, that I had. There's actually lots more. Um, anyone have time <laughs> to keep going? Um, but I'll just leave you with that, that tip that I, I had, which was use force with lease when you're doing this uh, to make sure that you don't accidentally clobber somebody else's commits. Cool. Uh, thank you.